Testing, testing. All right, welcome back to CS 4510. Um, lecture uh, 18B. Uh, the topic of today's lecture is the relativization barrier. Relativization. Uh, basically, we're going to prove that um, we have no idea what the proof of P versus NP can look like. Uh, but we know what it can't look like. Um, and that's crazy to me. This is one of my favorite results because it's like, how do we know what we can't know? We know what we can't, we know what it doesn't look like. We don't know what it does. So previously we talked about the diagonalization method as it applies to computability theory, or, uh, complexity theory. But in previous computability theory, we're able to separate uh, P from XP. We know that there are, by diagonalization, problems which are in XP but not in P. Uh, we can just weaken the, the, the time hierarchy theorem as proved, and prove a separation like this. We also do the same thing for P space versus XP space and so on. Who says we cannot separate uh, P from NP via diagonalization? Who's to say that that's not something we can do? Um, uh, it turns out uh, this is how we're going to prove it today. We're going to prove you cannot separate, not only by diagonalization, you can't separate P from NP, by diagonalization, but any sort of trivial technique. Um, in fact, uh, most techniques at first glance appear to have this property, and no proof with this property can separate P from NP. This is a first look about how hard this problem really is. So what is, uh, an, uh, we need to introduce actually quite a lot of, 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 of build up to this. An Oracle, have any of you heard the name Oracle before? Actually, don't forget about that one company. But, the, but, but have you heard of Oracles in any other context besides that company called Oracle? Isn't the Matrix guy in the movie The Matrix? Is, is it? No, his name was... No, the guy's name was Neo, but there was, like, something Oracle. There is, like, an Oracle person in The Matrix? Yeah. The Oracle of Delphi was this ancient Greek figure. It was basically, you know, a magic eight ball if it was a job. You went to her with some sort of offering, and she would tell you an answer, but she would not tell you how you got it. So an Oracle in computer science... It, and I'm probably in the matrix as well. I was actually curious to see if there's any pop sci reference to an oracle. But it, it's basically a device that tells you an answer. It's a magic eight ball. It tells you an answer, but it doesn't tell you anything about how it gets. And an oracle machine is one with access to an oracle. So we have some machine M and A. Uh, M is just a normal machine. A is the oracle. So this is not, not a Turing machine, but we call it an oracle machine. Basically, A is a language. The machine somehow has some second tape. It has like a normal tape. Uh, and then it has like a second oracle tape. Maybe it's unbounded. Um, and this is only for the oracle. And it can write down an answer on the tape and then issue an instruction. And somehow magically, in a single step of time, the tape is cleared and the answer is written down. And the answer is if the string is in the language or not, if it's in um, A or not. A is a language. So we say M has oracle access to language A. This is what we mean by an oracle machine. Totally hypothetical, totally magical, totally made up. But it allows us to consider relative computing, which is where the word relativization comes from. It allows us to study problems about the complexity of certain problems relative to another problem. This should be quite familiar to you because every reduction kind of feels like this anyway. Um, but an or the difference, there's a big difference between like a reduction kind of argument and an oracle argument because the reductions as presented, the many one reductions and the uh, polynomial time reductions, uh, you're allowed to make like one query. Here, the machine is allowed to make several queries, as many queries as it, as it wants, unless it has some other bound on it. Um, right. So consider, like, uh, we can say uh, for class C, C and language A, we define class uh, C to the A to be uh, languages decidable by C machines with oracle access to A. So basically, each machine has this device attached to it. It's plugged in. And in a single step, it can determine membership in the language or not. Now, there is a slight complication I want to mention. Do you measure the time it takes to write down the question on the tape? That depends on who you ask. 
And only some theorems differ on if you have to measure that. For example, if you have access to an exponential problem solver, uh, it maybe requires you to write down an exponentially sized string, and then that might be problematic. Uh, there's very, very few results that depend on actually accessing the tape. But just pretend at, uh, we're above the machine level, and somehow the problem uh, just can, the machine can just know. It can, it can answer these questions to itself in unit time, and it can continue computing. So as an example, let's consider P uh, with Oracle access to SAT. So what is this? This is a polynomial time-bounded machine. The machines run in a polynomial number of steps, but however, they have Oracle access to SAT. They can input a formula, a CNF formula, and, and learn if this formula is satisfiable in unit time, in one step, they can learn if a formula is satisfiable or not. Certainly, though, uh, what is the relationship between this class and P? Here we have, a, instead of Turing machines, which have polynomial number of steps, we have Oracle machines. And each Oracle machine um, has access to SAT in a, in a magical eight-ball way. What is the relationship between P and P SAT? P is a subset of PSAT? Yes, why? It's, it seems like PSAT is a lot more powerful because it has Oracle access to SAT, which we know um, can solve, well, first of all, any NP problem. Um, that is also true. Let's go through these slowly. First of all, why is P a subset of PSAT? Convert every Turing machine. P consists of language decidable by deterministic Turing machines with halt and a polynomial number of steps. Convert every Turing machine into an oracle machine such that the oracle machine just ignores its oracle. Fine, it just doesn't make every, any oracle calls. You can also think of an oracle like an API. Okay? If you just don't make any API calls, you still have access to the API, you just never used it. So certainly P is a subset of P sat. However, as you've mentioned, uh, NP is a subset of P sat as well. Why? Every language, we know by the Cook-Levin theorem for all L in NP, uh, that L, there's a polynomial time reduction from L uh, to SAT. Right? SAT is to NP complete. So what you can do is to decide every language uh, in NP to, sh to give an Oracle machine for every non-deterministic language is you simply take the reduction, compute the reduction, get a SAT formula out of it, and then the polynom this deterministic Oracle machine is going to ask its Oracle if it's satisfiable or not. And if it's satisfiable, it's going to accept it. Since the reduction is computable in polynomial time, we have a polynomial bounded machine. It only has to make one query. Certainly, NP is in PSAT. Here's a question that I think you guys will get wrong. Is NP equal to PSAT? No. Why? NP intermediate uh, problems. Oh, wow. But the, uh, the Cook-Levin theorem doesn't just take uh, a reduction for the NP-complete problems to SAT formulas. It goes from all of NP. So technically, you could map these NP-intermediate problems to SAT formulas as well. The reduction takes just an... Uh, an uh, that's, a great, that's a great answer but, uh, and a great question. But it takes a non-deterministic computation that converts it to a SAT formula, not necessarily one that's NP-complete. So you could take graph isomorphism or factoring and turn that into a SAT formula as well. Uh, and the reduction still holds. Um, in a more complicated way. Turns out, because uh, I don't expect you to get this, PSAT also contains co-NP. And then that might imply something about co-NP equaling NP, which we don't believe to be true. So actually, we don't know if this is, a, we don't know if this is um, uh, equal. And it turns out that even, you could even speed it up. NP, we think, is a strict subset of NP to the SAT. We think that's strict. Like, even though SAT is in NP, uh, turns out this might speed some things up because it takes some time to compute certain things. And then by having Oracle access, you can speed that certain part up, right? Here's, a, here's, a, here's an obvious statement. What, what is, if A is a language in P, uh, what is P to the A equal to? Again, P to the A is an oracle machine. It somehow has access to a polynomial time language. It has oracle access to this polynomial time language. What, do you, what would you expect P to the A be equal to? Just P? Yes, why? 
So A is in polynomial time. So it's not really doing anything for you that P is in already. Yeah. Like, uh, you could quote unquote de oracleify uh, the problem by converting the oracle to an algorithm. Like, this is an API. We're calling it magic. But if it's decidable, you can just decide it and then count the time as your own. So anytime you make an oracle call, convert that to an algorithm subroutine call. It's still polynomial time. You can make polynomial many, many queries to a polynomial time algorithm. Suddenly, you now have polynomial time algorithm. The whole thing is polynomial time. So it gives you no power there. But that's only for A's and P, certainly. right? Um, oracles, of, of course, are more magic than this. This is sort of useless. We wouldn't talk about it this way. Uh, the oracle could be halt. Like the first invention of this was to study rel like if halt was decidable. Suppose you had oracle access to halt. You can say yes and no, no and yes. What other languages are still undecidable? That was like the primary question. Um, so it's not even necessary that A be decidable. It can be anything, anything magic, anything crazy uh, is what we care about oracles. So we don't actually care. Here we've only done some examples of, of an oracle, of, of uh, comparisons of uh, classes of languages, one with and one without an oracle. But it turns out that we're not primarily concerned with that. In our world, we, we're concerned about an entire alternate universe, an entire world relative to a certain oracle. So in our world, we're concerned with the questions like as L, uh, P, uh, and P, and P space, right? We have these structural questions, we have these big classes, and of course there's others. Um, these are the classes we're concerned with, and we're concerned with them relative to our own world. But for each language, consider an alternate reality where the members and the, you and the people in that world, maybe they're like Dr. Seuss-looking people, they're concerned with their own uh, oracle questions. So we're concerned with us. This is our world. Uh, their world would be like, uh, they're concerned with the relationship between L of A, uh, P to the A, and I'll put a question mark under all of these, and P to the A, and uh, p space to the a, right? So every in the world relative to a, when we say the world relative to a, we are concerned where every machine also has equal access to this oracle a within their bound. Polynomial space machine, excuse me, polynomial time machine can only make polynomially many queries to a. It's a polynomial time machine. Each query requires one unit of time. Can only make polynomial many queries. Still limited. But P space, you can only use polynomial space unbounded in time, so it can make n as many queries as it wants. It's a very different problem because now we have to consider a kind of query complexity along with the resource complexity that we already have. It's kind of orthogonal. Um, and in the world, quote unquote, the world relative to A, um, every class has the oracle A. Um, now, we say a proof, what, what is the difference between, uh, by the way, there's uncountably many languages, so there's uncountably many of these alternate universes. And we can study the structure of these alternate universes by studying structure of our own, because certain proofs appear to quote unquote relativize. So a proof relativizes, or I'll just define it, proof relativizes, and, you know, complexity theorists are great at thinking of these sci-fi words. I can't spell. Relativizes. Totally deranged, made-up word. A proof relativizes if you can copy, paste it uh, from our world uh, to all relativized worlds. So sometimes a theorem is true in our world. And if it's copy-pastable, it's true then in all, therefore in our world. What I mean by copy-pasting is consider the following. Like we proved, uh, I'll give the, like the rough proof that time of n to the k is a strict subset of time uh, n to the k uh, plus 1. Most proofs relativize. Specifically, the time hierarchy theorem relativizes. And let's kind of give you what I mean by copy-paste. So here's our world. We have D on input uh, W. Uh, we're going to compute 
also wi. Compute n is equal to the size of wi. Um, simulate Well, let me write it this way. Let uh, uh, m1, m2 be n to the k machines. So these have all a time bound of n to the k. Again, of course, you can't do this uh, by Rice's theorem, but uh, we mentioned a way how to fix it when the time proof of the time hierarchy theorem. So let's just pretend that we can do that again. So let m1, m2 be machines which halt an n to the k number of steps. We're going to create d on input wi. It's going to compute n equals wi. And then it's going to simulate wi on, uh, on mi on wi for uh, n to the k steps. Um, then we're going to return the opposite, a 1 minus mi on wi. Right. What I mean by relativize here is we're going to copy and paste the proof with some small modifications. Uh, let M1A, M2A, uh, be n to the k machines. But instead of Turing machines, now these are oracle machines. Each machine now has access to this oracle A. Uh, our diagonalization is going to be D to the A, D is going to have access to the same oracle uh, on input. This is quite literally a copy paste, WI. It's going to compute uh, N is equal to WI. Uh, simulate. And the simulation requires an extra step, so I'm going to put a star here. Simulate uh, MIA on WI for N to the K steps. Um, and it's going to return the opposite. So I call that 1 minus m i a on w i. All right? Any questions about these two proofs? What they're doing? I've quite literally copied and pasted this proof. However, I now instead of here, in our world, we're diagonalizing over n to the k machines, Turing machines. In the world relative to a, we're diagonalizing over what? The oracle machines. Each machine has oracle access to a. So does our diagonal, is diagonal machine to compute the difference. But this simulation has an extra star by it. It takes an extra sentence. Basically what happens is here when you simulate the machine in our world without the oracle, nothing happens. I mean, nothing goes wrong. If mi to the a is an oracle machine, it can make oracle calls. How do you simulate the oracle call? So mi to the a is, a is an oracle machine, not just a Turing machine. It may do normal computing steps, but it, then it may make oracle calls. How does d to the a simulate the oracle call of mi to the a? Is it asking how long it takes? Or? Ah, so mi to the a is a hypothetical imagined magic machine. It makes a hypothetical, imagined, and fake, magical API call. How do we simulate the API call? We don't, so we don't have access to that Turing machine, kind of. Ah, we do. Because we're in magic world relative to A as well. D has its own oracle. So basically, like uh, uh, d to the a simulating uh, mi to the a, if uh, mi to the a makes an oracle call, d to the a uh, simulates this by calling its own oracle. Right. So suppose you are like writing an emulator or something, and a machine makes an API, and the, the machine you're emulating makes an API call, and you need to simulate that to progress the emulation further. The way you have to do that is you just call your own API, basically. You implement the API, and then you just call it 
Anytime the machine you're simulating makes an API call, you yourself will make the API, API call and, and then proceed by the simulation, right? Um, so many of the proofs we appear uh, to have ever done in this course s appear to relativize. All the proofs for computability theory appear to relativize. A relativizing proof, again, is one, really the characteristic of a proof which relativizes is one which deals with computation only in a black box way. Here, the machine, we're not doing anything to the Oracle machine except simulating it. All we're doing is giving it input, doing exactly what it says, and then branching negation, neg negatively on its output. So computation here only occurs in a black box way. So a relativizing proof is not a very formal or intuitive, it's a formal notion and not an intuitive one. You can look at a proof and think this has to relativize because everything that occurs in the proof just appears to be doing black box sort of little magic. Nothing super deep uh, into it. Can you think of a theorem we've done in class which does not appear to relativize? That's a big, hard, that's a debatable, open, and hard question. Let's see if you can think of something. What's something we've done in the, comp in the complexity unit you would question is a relativizing proof. Can you go over what relativizing was again? Relativizing, a proof relativizes if you can copy and paste it in, from our world. So this is the proof in our world. This is the proof we did in the time hierarchy theorem, roughly. It's a little lazy. Uh, if you can copy and paste the proof into the relativized world, and then just make these simple. Look at, look at all I've changed. What is the, what is the difference between these two proofs? Uh, this and the simulation, right? Those are the only differences between the two proofs. We quite literally copied and pasted it with a very slight modification. So anything, a, a relativizing proof is one that if it's provable in our world, fine. But you can, it allow, the, proof, the structure of the, proof, of the proof allows you to copy and paste it to all these other worlds. So therefore, the, the statement that is true in our world is also true in all these other worlds. So every world also has their own version of a time hierarchy theorem because the proof of the time hierarchy theorem relativizes. We're also concerned what's different about these worlds. If we know, we know what's the same between these worlds and our world. We want to know what's different as well. So the relativizing proofs are exactly those which copy and paste. Is there a proof you can think of that we've done, and this is a hard open question because I'm asking you to remember everything we've did, uh, that does not relativize? If I had to come up with one, the one I would think of first would probably be the Cook-Levin theorem. And it is kind of questionable if it does or doesn't relativize. It's an intuitive notion. All the other ones appear to be kind of algorithms or black box ones. Certainly all the diagonalization ones we just did relativize. All the ones from computability theory certainly have to relativize. Um, what else have you? Savage's theorem? That probably relativizes. Um, what else? Maybe, maybe we just had trouble remembering everything we've done so far. Rice. Rice's theorem definitely relativizes. It's, sim it's a reduction and it just simulates other machines. That is plain as day, relativizes. Um, what else? What do we do in compl complexity? Complexity, NB completeness, all those reductions have to relativize, even if the Cook Levin theorem might not. The Cook Levin theorem, recall, we programmed a SAT formula to simulate the ex execution of a non deterministic machine. And it's not sure how we would, if, the, if it was an Oracle machine, how we would create an Oracle SAT formula, a CNF formula. That sounds weird. I don't know how to do that. So it probably doesn't relativize. And, it's, and that is actually debatable. I think there, there's, a, there's, there's debate about if, that, if it is a relativizing proof. I think you could add something that are like Oracle circuits or something, and that maybe you get something there. Um, uh, and there, are, there is a, there's an article by three authors that think that the, that the, ex, the, the proofs ex, which don't relativize are exactly ones which are just Cook-Levin and its variants. Um, this is what it means for a proof to relativize. Any question on if I gave you a proof and if I asked you if it relativizes or not, could you, could you think 
you, you guys could get when it does and when it doesn't relativize. It's not sure what a non-relativizing proof is yet, but certainly you can see some very trivial copy-paste mechanisms and some mi slight modification to the simulation, we get a relativizing proof. Now, how does this relate to P uh, versus NP? Well, um, uh, we give Oracle A uh, such that um, P to the A equals NP to the A. We give an Oracle such that it, relative to the world, the problem in this world of P versus NP is solved in the equal sense. So relative to Oracle A, P to the A equals NP to the A. We'll give that Oracle A. If I give, but, a, but a relativizing proof is one that generalizes from our world to all worlds. So by giving a world where they're equal, we know that there is no relativizing proof that P does not equal NP. So uh, there does not exist a relativizing proof of P does not equal NP, right? If there did exist a relativizing proof that P does not equal NP, it would be true in all, all worlds. However, we can give one world where it's not true. So therefore, there cannot exist such a proof that relativizes. So you cannot prove relativizing that P does not equal NP in our world. Similarly, we give Oracle B. Uh, such that P to the B does not equal NP to the B. So there does not exist a relativizing proof that P equals NP uh, from our world. Any questions on what the statement is so far? This is kind of an intuitive proof. Like when you get to proof theory or whatever, it's very formal and rigorous about what the structure of a logical proof is. But this is an intuitive notion about what certain proofs can't look like. We're giving an oracle A. By giving this oracle A, we're giving a world where P equals NP. That means no proof of P does not equal NP can generalize. Relativization is a very fixed, specific kind of generalization. Certain proofs appear to generalize, quote unquote, relativize to all worlds. But if we can give a world where they're equal, then you couldn't be able to prove it that they're not equal in a way that also generalizes. We also give a world where they're not equal. We give two worlds, one where they're equal and one where they're not. By giving a world where they're not equal, then no proof that they're equal can generalize from our world. The P versus NP question admits contradictory relativizations. There are two worlds that are different. By exhibiting two worlds that are different, no proof from our world can have this generalizing structure that we call relativizing. No proof of, of, our, of our world of P versus NP can be a relativizing proof. If we can display oracles A and B that have this property, then we know no such trivial proof like this can separate P from NP. No diagonalization proof uh, exists to separate P from NP. And it immediately makes the question much harder. It makes it obvious by showing this how hard the question actually is. We need to somehow deal intrinsic, intrinsically with the computation instead of in just sort of black box execution and simulation things. Uh, I, I'll repeat it again, but a, a relativizing proof appears to be one that is either just diagonalization or trivial simulations. Computations are done in a black box way. And again, this is like a function. This is the reason I emphasize the functional part, right? If I give you a function like uh, phi of i of x or something, right? When, I, when you represent computation functionally, there's only a few things you can do. You can give it input, you can give it output, which is like you read the whole function, and then you can choose a different co computation to run it on. So computation represented in a functional way is not going to resolve P versus NP. Immediately, if you, by knowing the relativization barrier, and this is, what, this is the first barrier to P versus NP, there are at least three. The natural proofs barrier, we know that P versus NP does not have a natural proof. And we, then we know that P versus NP does not have, 
there's no algebra, algebraizing proof of p resident p. That, what those are is way too complicated. But we know that there are three barriers, throughout history at least, of what p versus np can't, be, can't look like. People try to prove p versus np using proofs that have a similar structure. We've hit a, a barrier. And what that means is the proof can't look like your proof. So we know your proof is wrong. We don't know how to prove it, but we know how not to prove it, is what, is what the statement is. Um, any questions on this part before we get to showing oracles A and oracles B? This is a really uh, frightful and scare, scary theorem, I think. It's really interesting to know that, that's what the theory, that we know what the proof cannot look like. Uh, it's ter kind of terrifying. OK, so let's just give uh, Oracle A first. And that's actually surprisingly easy. So I want to, so first off, the containment one way is easy. So we really just want to prove that there exists A uh, such that NP to the A is contained within P to the A, right? The reverse inclusion is going to be true for every Oracle A. Non-determinism still generalizes by having the machine. So we just want to show that there's one Oracle that does it this way, right? An Oracle, and, and if you think about an Oracle, an Oracle is really like lifting the problem, okay? NP to the A is bigger than NP. P to the A is bigger than P. Because you could, given access to this Oracle, you can certainly decide more things. So we want to lift both P to the A and NP to the A to like the same level where non-determinism doesn't really matter. Uh, we want to, it appears to matter in our world, we can't prove it that P does not equal NP because non-determinism appears to make that difference. But if we can grow both of them to a large enough level that they're the same, that non-determinism actually has no effect, we can like dilute it out, then we can, that's, what the, that's, the, that's the motivation for designing an Oracle A. And it turns out, uh, that non-determinism doesn't matter for P space. So we'll do that. We're going to say uh, NP to a P space complete problem, which is TQBF, right? You recall what TQBF was for the P space collector? Uh, true quantified Boolean formula is a P space complete problem, okay? Now, we can, we uh, want to show this is equal to P to the TQBF, and that will complete the existence of a world where P to the A does not equal NP to the A. Recall that's what we want to show. So we can, first let's de-oracleize this. We can replace the oracle for TQBF by an algorithm for TQBF. If you recall, what was the complexity of the algorithm for TQBF? Was it two to the something? Time complexity wise, sure, but what about space? Certainly, it's harder than SAT, and SAT only appears to have exponential time algorithms, so it should be at least harder than SAT. I think it was Kaufman. Space? Linear. Um, yeah, I think it was linear, actually. But it was polynomial, certainly. We gave, to prove TQBF was p-space complete, we had to show it was in p-space. So it certainly is, we can de-oracleize this with an algorithm that uses polynomial space. And then we can just keep simulating the non-determinism. Right, so if we de-oracleize this by converting the oracle to an algorithm, what kind of cl class do we get? We get NP space. Right? We can convert the oracle non-deterministic polynomial oracle machine to a poly non-deterministic polynomial space machine. Why? By converting the oracle to an algorithm which uses a much polynomial space. And we just keep this class non-deterministic to simulate the non-determinism of this. Okay. This containment is true. We believe this. Okay. Uh, what is NP space? What do we know about NP space? Equals P space? Yeah. Why? We discussed, um, I don't recall the exact argument, but um, or do you know the didn't name really of the theorem? do anything. The name of the theorem? Uh, was it someone's name? Or yes. Right? You're totally right, though. Non-determinism doesn't give us any power. Uh, it wasn't Clark. No, but that would be cool. It was Savage. Oh, right. Yeah, Little Jeopardy trivia question there. Yeah. NP space is equal to P space by Savage's theorem. Fine. Now, we want to show this is equal to uh, P to the TQBF, right? And that would conclude the result that we want. But why is that true, right? TQBF is a P space complete problem. 
And P space is just P space. We want to prove that relative to TQBF, all of P space can be computed in polynomial time, given an oracle for TQBF. TQBF is P space complete. So like if L is in, uh, like if L is in P space, we know that there is a polynomial time reduction uh, from L to TQBF, right? We gave a transformation like we did for the Cook-Levin theorem of TQBF, TQBF being P space complete. You can use this reduction to transform every, uh, if you can determine like W is in L if and only if some formula phi is in TQBF. So you can give a polynomial oracle machine to decide every P space problem. It's going to compute the reduction. And then it's just going to determine if that formula is going in TQBF by asking its oracle. And if the oracle returns yes, it's going to accept the input. Right? So we can believe then that P space is a subset of T P relative to TQBF. All of polynomial space computation is polynomial time relative to the oracle for a P space complete problem. We agree with this. OK, well, we have a containment here. NP to the TQBF all the way P to TQBF. So A, proven true. We have now exhibited, and this is actually the more important direction, it turns out, because we actually believe in our world that P does not equal NP. So by showing this oracle A, we have ruled out, any, we have ruled out every relativizing proof from our world that P does not equal NP. So you see a proof online that says P does not equal NP, and it appears to only do trivial basic simulation. Uh, most proofs, by the way, relativize. Almost all of them appear to relativize. So most of the proofs that we could even come up with will not show P does not equal NP. We need some very crazy techniques. So we've done with this half. Uh, any questions on this before we get to the what's well, arguably the harder half? We want to show a world where P does not equal NP. Any questions on the point? Is it con have you been convinced that we know we don't know what the proof we can't prove it from our world? Okay. Again, relativization is kind of an intuitive notion. It's not like a very strong proof theoretic notion, you know. Um, but that's kind of what makes it accessible and easeable. You don't have to develop any proof theory, proof complexity. Um, now we want to prove, we want to give an oracle B such that P, does not e P, P to the B does not equal NP to the B. Um, here's the first problem, is that if we were to design such an oracle to separate these two, we have to make sure we don't accidentally de design an oracle use a technique that can separate P from NP without the oracle. Because uh, then we could just prove P versus not P. To, we could just prove the problem for our world. We're just proving a problem for the special world. So ironically, we're going to construct, we will construct oracle B by diagonalization. We're going to basically choose and pick and choose strings to be in B or not in B so that uh, the machines are always wrong, basically. So we're going to prove some L, so showing the language is in NP is easy. We just want to show it's not in P to the B. So what we're going to do is just force the machine to make exponentially many Oracle queries for it to be correct. So we're going to say like uh, 1 to the N is in L to the B, which is going to be the language, uh, if and only if um, no string of length N is in B. And then we're going to want to show, we want to conclude that L to the B is in NP to the B, but then not in P to the B. That's what we want to show. So somehow it's going to be able to be in P into P to the B, and it's not going to be in P to the B, right? How many strings of length N are there? Yeah, so basically, whatever decider on input 1 to the N has to make, to correctly decide one L to the B, has to correctly make two to the N oracle queries to B. It's not, but it's only, but it's polynomially bounded. It's only going to be able to make N to the I oracle queries, not two to the N. So only using polynomially many oracle queries, we're just going to keep changing B on it. We're quite literally going to construct B by diagonalization. We're going to keep changing B so the machine's always wrong. And by doing so, uh, we'll prove that no such or machine exists. All the machines are wrong. And again, it's sort of a, it's a more loose and intuitive argument than it is. Uh, the formal one is uh, is quite messy. But uh, suppose let let uh, let m one be m two be 
be an enumeration of Oracle machines of uh, p to the b. So each one runs in polynomial time. Uh, so e you may even suppose that uh, m i to the b halts in uh, n to the i steps. Now, obviously, as previously discussed with the time hierarchy theorem, you can't do that. But the fix for it is like way too complicated. I don't care enough. You can just probably, it's safe to assume that. I mean, you can't, but if you could, the fix for this is messy, but just suppose you could. We believe me, right? We'll have to do something else complicated. Um, so we can just assume that mi to the b halts in n to the i steps. Okay? We construct b in a sequence of stages. Uh, at each stage, only a finite amount of strings have been chosen to be in and not in b. And we ensure that mi to the b uh, is wrong on stage i. So like at each stage, we ensure um, mi to the b. At each stage i, we ensure mi to the b uh, does not decide uh, lb, right? So we just gonna keep, we're just going to keep changing b uh, so that mi to the b is wrong. Because mi to the b is going to be some polynomial machine. It's going to make some polynomial make queries, right? So suppose we are at stage i. We're at stage i. Uh, finitely many strings have been said to be in b and said to be not in b. Uh, let uh, w be the longest string in b. Uh, choose n such that uh, 2 to the n is greater than n to the i and... Uh, n is greater than the length of w. So we're going to choose only longer strings. At each stage, we just really decide the strings of the next length. Um, right? We want to increase the knowledge about b such that... How did I word this? Uh, such that m i to the b accepts uh, 1 to the n um, if and only if um, no string of length uh, uh, n is in b. Right, excuse me, is in B, yeah. So how are we going to do this? We're just going to run mi to the B on 1 to the n. And then if it, accepts a, if it accepts it, we just change B so that it doesn't decide L to the B. That's basically all we have to do. So we're going to run mi to the B on 1 to the n. Uh, if uh, mi to the b queries its oracle on a previously decided string, string, the oracle, again, it has oracle access to language b. It's going to uh, respond appropriately. It responds correctly. So recall at each stage of this process, we have said yes and no to so many finitely many strings at each step. So if it asks a string previously, hey, is this string in the language or not, the oracle will respond correctly. Because we're not going to change the strings that have already been decided, basically. If it queries its oracle 
on a string never seen before. The oracle prophesizes, can I spell that? Is that a word? Prophesizes, no. So if, the, if, the, if, the, we, if we haven't made a decision on a specific string and the machine asks the oracle, is this string in my language? Is this string in your language B? Uh, the machine is just going, the, the oracle is going to respond no, and that's going to make the decision for that specific string. So if the machine asks its oracle on a bunch of strings, they're all going to say no, 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 it appears. Like if the strings have not been decided yet, it's going to say no, 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 no. Um, but we want for L, it's only going to, we, we don't want it to decide one to the B. And it can only correctly decide one to the B if it tests all strings, all two to the N strings. But only giving polynomial many queries, it's not going to be able to ask to the n queries. It's going to be able to ask n to the i queries because we, do, we assume that it halts in n to the i steps. Maximum you can make is n to the i queries. So there's going to be some strings it can't query. There has to be some string of length n it did not query. And we're going to choose one of those to be in b if it rejects. So if, if uh, mib accepts one to the n, choose a string it did not query to be in uh, b. If mi to the b rejects uh, one to the n, Oh, my bad. If mi to the b accepts 1 to the n, uh, no string should be in b, right? No string of length n will be defined to be in b. If mi to the b rejects n, Choose a string it uh, did not query to be in um, B. This is enough for us to ensure what? Uh, that the language decided by MI to the B Recall that LB is, contains the sim string 1 to the n, if and only if no string of length n is in B, right? So if MI rejects 1 to the B, we put a string in B so that to ensure that L of MI to the B, the language accepted by the machine, can never be uh, LB. Um, and because these are the machines which enumerate polynomial time oracle machines, we know, therefore, that LB is not in P. P to the B, excuse me. Okay? Any questions on this horrible argument? But it is kind of a diagonalization thing. It is an infinite process to define a language, but the language need not even be computable. We, there's uncountably many languages, and as long as we can show that there exists one. Certainly, there's if uncountably many languages, any one of them is the output of this process were it to stop. So we, that is the language in the world where P, does not, P to the B does not equal NP to the B. Now, we've shown that this language is not in P to the B. Why is it an NP to the B? Here's a hard one. So the limitation of this machine, again, is that it was forced to make exponentially many queries to be correct. Using non-determinism, can you, can you make the machine polynomial time instead of exponential? Could you repeat the question? So this machine, we were able to show this machine a polynomial time oracle machine would not correctly decide this language. And the way we would do that is we basically define the language so that only exponentially many queries could correctly define the language. Using only polynomial many queries, right? It, to, to decide if 1 to the n is in uh, L to the b requires uh, what? 2 to the n queries and not possible 
with only n to the i queries, right? If you only make n to the i queries, you're not, there's going to be some strings unqueried. So you're going to be able to make a mistake. You're going to make a mistake, basically, if you try and guess. Um, so it requires 2 to the n queries to correctly determine if uh, 1 to the n is in L of B. Why is this? That's, the machine takes exponentially many queries. How can you do this faster with non-determinism? Make a non-deterministic oracle machine. So now it has two degrees of fake computational power. It has access to an oracle and access to non-determinism. Given a machine with access to non-determinism and an oracle, can you speed up its ability to decide L to the B? So it's asking for some non-deterministic way to reduce the number of queries. If you think about it, x non-determinism really is like a finite but exponential speed up, right? Think about SAT, deterministic algorithms for SAT versus non-deterministic ones. A deterministic algorithm has to try all two to the n possibilities. Assignments. A non-deterministic one just somehow correctly guesses the assignment, and it's satisfiable. Fine. Uh, similar here. Similarly here, what you do is you use the non-determinism to just guess the correct queries you're supposed to make. You don't need all two to the n. You just need to know that one string of length n is in the language or not. So you just correctly guess that string. Or you correctly guess 0 if none are, are there or something like that. right? It can do, so basically, you replace this kind of exponential search part by non-deterministically guessing the correct queries to make. And by that, you don't have to check all of them. You just have to check the right ones. That's sufficient, it turns out, to show that uh, L to the B is not in, uh, excuse me, is in. Uh, NP to the B. Right. Kind of an ugly argument, I think, to, to get this kind of thing, but it's necessary. All right. I have one more piece of evidence in favor of worlds where NP, uh, P relative to an oracle, uh, NP does not equal P. Um, any questions on this argument before we, we, we go on? So this one requires a, like a way too rigorous proof, uh, which we won't do. Uh, but I can, but there's, it's much easier, I think, intuitive, intuitively about why it's true. What we're going to do is we're going to prove that um, uh, uh, for R, a random oracle, uh, the probability that NP to the R is equal, uh, it's not equal to p to the r, is 1. So relative to a random oracle, np does not equal p, right? Um, if r is, if you consider the randomness of r to be fixed, r is a random oracle with, um, it has equal probability to be any language. By a random oracle, I mean the oracle responds to answers consistently, but whenever asked a new string, it, fix, it flips a coin. So it doesn't know what language it is until it's done as answered every question. But it has equal probability to be any language. I claim that it's with, there is a language in NP to the R and not in P to the R. Proving that the, this is true with probability one, basically this proves most languages, for most languages, the problem for most worlds, P does not equal NP. And maybe only countably many worlds does P equal NP. But for most of them, uncountably many, overwhelmingly many, requires some measure theory, real analysis actually to prove this. But uh, intuitively, it, it, it's true. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to put a language in NP to the R and that's not in uh, P to the R. And it's basically something like this. Like, uh, we'll, we'll say like 1 to the N is in uh, L if and only if, and again, we have to rely on oracle access instead of accidentally solving p versus np. 1 to the n is in L, uh, if and only if, if 
in the first uh, two to the n oracle queries. Uh, there exists a run of n ones. So you can think of the oracle as access to an infinite string, right? So a um, a language has a characteristic string, right? One if the string is in the language and a zero not, right? Like if you have epsilon zero one. 0, 0, and so on. You could put this as 1, 0, 1, 1, and so on, depending on which the strings, 1 if it's in, and 0 if it's not, right? So if you think about relative to a random oracle, you can consider an oracle machine actually has in access to a pre-written tape with this random string of 1s and zeros on it. So this language is going to contain 1 to the n, if and only if, in the first 2 to the n uh, symbols, there exists a run of n1s. Do you know what the probability is that uh, in the first, if you have two to the n coin flips, what's the probability that there's n sequential heads in a row? The first n are heads or in, in any? In any position, anywhere in the two to the n, there's n consecutive heads. Hard, this is actually a difficult question. So there's two of the n flips. And there's a sequence of them that's n in a row. So the total number of flips is two to the n plus one? Or two to the n. Two to the n flips in general. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the total number of outcomes is two to the n plus one, I meant to say. Correct. Thank you. Um, well, hold on. Let me not to get too complicated. I'm running out of time. Two to the two to the n. I think, it's, I think it's one half. I think the probability of this occurring is one half. I could work that out later. Um, so why is, why, is, uh, why is L in uh, NP to the R? Give a non-deterministic algorithm to determine this. You said the probability is one half? I think, yeah. But find, find, how do you find this for sure non-deterministically? Let's say you have a random string of length 2 to the n. You couldn't even read the string. It's 2 to the n, long. Polynomial time cannot read exponentially long things. How do you know, though, that L is an np to the r? Non-determinism, use non-determinism to solve it faster. What you can do is use non-determinism to just guess the position of the run, and then count n queries, and then that's going to be it. Now, showing that L is not in uh, P to the R is actually quite difficult, because you have to hope that, you have to somehow show that every algorithm that never gets lucky often enough. Every algorithm, there might be, like, let's say your first run was in the first n things, and you have an algorithm that guesses the first n. Well, that might accidentally decide it, but you want to show that probability is pretty low. So the analysis to show that L is not in P to the R is very difficult compared to just quickly showing that it is in P to the R. Um, so uh, just, to, just, to, just to wrap up and finish what we've done today, we've shown two worlds, uh, one where the problem for P versus NP is true and the one where the P versus NP is false, or false and true or whatever, right? Uh, there's two worlds where the answers are different. In fact, most worlds, we've, most worlds P does not equal NP. Uh, but there are at least two different worlds. One relative to p-space, a p-space uh, uh, complete problem has non-determinism has no power, uh, and all the other ones appear that p does not equal np. Um, because there are these two different worlds, we know that no proof of p versus np from our world can relativize to all these worlds. So we know that p versus np does not have a proof that relativizes, basically. Uh, and that was kind of, that was the first hint historically that this is actually a very difficult problem. People hoped that you could separate P from NP as easy as we could separate the decidable languages from the recognizable ones. Because P versus NP appears to be a similar question about resource. You know, is anything decidable recognizable versus everything polynomial time versus this imaginary polynomial time thing? Um, so there hoped to be a similar separation and the problem would be solved as quick. But of course, these, these, these doubts were very wrong. Um, 
if you look online now, you know, the, if you see a proof of P versus NP, and I see maybe 20 on my desk every year, uh, the proofs are all, all of them basically relativize. Um, the quickly, really quick way to discard the proofs. Um, this is a beautiful result, even if, the, even if the proof is kind of messy, because you know what the proof, we don't, again, I'll repeat myself, we don't know what the proof of P versus NP looks like, but we know certainly what it can't look like. Any questions? <laughs>